This is the Anthony Colavita Radio Show. Anthony Colavita is the former New York State and Westchester County Republican Party chairman. Now, here's Anthony Colavita. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Delighted to be back. Uh, and I'm delighted especially to be here with my dear old friend for many, many years, Congressman Joe Diaguardi. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Tony. Delighted Thank you for to inviting be, me. Oh, you kidding. It's great. Uh, and the, you, 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 you're a perfect <laughs> guest to have when I came come back after, uh, what, a uh, month and a half, I guess. Terrific. I didn't know you were gone that, that long. It and, shows and you how much people miss me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy that you asked me to drive you home after the show because yeah. now I know why you can't drive. I see the cane at all. You're yeah, right. yeah. I didn't know you went through that operation. We have a couple of calls, so let's go to the telephone. Great. Hello. You're on w- WBOX. Good morning. Tony, is that me? <coughs> Frank. Hey, Frank, how are you? Christmas, Happy New Year to you and Joe Diaguardi. <coughs> thank you, Frank. Joe Diaguardi, I voted for him many times. Thank you, thank you. Well, Every I hope chance I got <laughs> not the same I election, I hope. Hey, Frank, I'm sitting here and yeah. we're re- reminiscing with Tony yeah. and uh, just in the last 25 years. Don't forget, it was 25 years ago that Tony was a Republican leader who allowed me to run for Congress. I remember. And uh, we're just... You, were, were you ran against the hat, didn't you? Well, I, that was the second no, that was race. second time. The first one I announced against Ottinger, he retired. I ended yeah, up... Yeah, I remember the guy. Yeah. But I, the thing I wanted to tell you is that with all Tony's pain, he's beaming with smiles as we talk about the good old days here. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we had a lot of... got a lot to smile about. Let me get to a couple of local sure, things, Tony, sure. then I'll let you guys go. No problem. We got a new chairman of the board who don't know where he lives. <laughs> How the hell is Janet DeFiori allowed this to go on? She's looking into the other race in Yonkers. Why isn't she looking into this guy Jenkins and whether or not he's filing false uh, uh, paperwork with the Board of Elections as to where he really lives? And I think Rob Astorino, if he's going to have to work with that chairman, he's got to know he's working with a reputable person. Let's find out where this guy lives. This system stinks from the top to the bottom. Now, I know Astorino can't do nothing about that second job because... I guess it's somewhere in, in the legislated that you get a commissioner, you get a deputy commissioner on a board of elections, one from a couple from Democrats, a couple from Republicans. But let me tell you, that woman's going to go in there and make $125,000 a year. Now, the Republican side, they may get the same thing. But in these kind of tough, rough times, and I see it, I'm in the private sector. I'm out of every day with guys struggling and juggling to meet the, uh, to meet the note. You know what I'm saying? And when I think that these bums are going to hire these two wastes, to go up there and make 125000 a year. I mean, this is the foot we're going to get off on with Astorino. The least the guy could do was put out a press release and say, I'm totally against it. I'd like to see it changed. I don't think it's a good idea. I could do a lot more with that 125000 than waste it on this woman and whoever the Republicans put in there. I hope he at least got enough common sense. If he's legit about who he says he really is, he'll come out with a statement like that. Or is it just going to be business as usual? Hmm. I hope not. But Happy New Year, fellas. The best of both of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Frank. Right I, I think the first thing, uh, of course, is uh, uh, with the new Astorino as the county executive, I, I think we have to give him a chance. You know, we've let things go f- for years. I think about uh, an old good man, well, he died at a very good age, Sal Precioso. Oh, sure. And you remember how hard he worked on Westchester 2000 yes, yes. to try to streamline government. What happened? It didn't happen. And we could have done this in good times. Now we're in bad times, but we let it go because people get seduced by, you know, all right, last year wasn't that bad or maybe it wasn't that good, but we add a couple of percent. <coughs> it doesn't really look like it's a problem until 10, 20, 30 years go by, and all of a sudden Westchester is the most expensive county to live in in the United States of America, at least with the taxes. So we know that there is voter anger out there, and this, I think, is going to now spur a lot of reform. And that's why Paul Feiner and I, a Democrat and a Republican, decided months ago, this wasn't a reaction to the Astorino race, to do something to see if we could um, jumpstart some kind of streamlining process, at least to set the tone for it. Yes, and and, and that's... What started, I guess you call it the Rethink Westchester? Rethinking, right, rethink because Westchester. there are no easy answers, and we don't think yeah. we've got all the answers, but we need to start the process, make it public, energize people to get involved. You need the people to get involved, not just on Election Day. We need citizens to get involved, even in government. I remember with my work <clears throat> in New York City uh, when my firm, Arthur Anderson, was hired as part of the bailout. The Treasury hired my firm to piece together the books of New York City. No one could figure out what New York City was worth, what its real debt was. 
So here we, we spent a year. I was one of the young partners in those days assigned to it. Well, one of the things that we encouraged them to do was to revive the Citizens Budget Commission so that you had qualified financial type, CPAs, investment bankers, you know, looking at what was going on so that we could make a comeback in the city, which is what happened. We need that kind of a process in Westchester and probably in every jurisdiction and maybe in every school district. The citizens have to look over the shoulders of these big spenders. I was at a meeting uh, with the Republican leader in Scarsdale. It's, it's Bob Cohen, I believe his mm-hmm. name is. And, and I just wanted to sit there and listen. But when I heard that the school district was looking for an 8% increase, people are losing their jobs and they want an 8% yeah. increase. And I asked, there was the former mayor there from way back in the 60s. I said, what does a teacher make in the school system? He says, Joe, you wouldn't believe it. The average pay for a teacher is 140000 And then someone chimed in, guess what our janitor makes in Scarsdale, the school district? 93000 Now, you know, these are telephone book numbers while people are being laid off. So we've got to share this burden somehow, and we've got to go back to square one and figure out how we allocate the costs of government to everybody. Well, Joe, tell us on an administrative, uh, from an administrative viewpoint, uh, you're doing some kind of a uh, uh, referendum. Uh, well, you know, New York State has not been good for initiative and referendum. We've been it, trying to do right. that. Well, but, you could but, do it voluntarily. You know. Well, we, we, we found a law on the books. Now, thank God on our little executive committee group, we have three attorneys. And uh, one of them is a highly qualified election lawyer who's working for a judge, so he can't be coming public, but he does a lot of research. And he came up with this law with the other two attorneys called the Alternative Form of County Government Law. It was passed in 1952 and has only been used by one county, Ulster County. And when they used it, they used the County Board of Legislators in their county to implement it. So we did a lot of research, and then I decided to raise the money in a foundation called Truth in Government, which I run, so we could hire an election lawyer who was not a volunteer, because if I'm going to come out public and say I've got an answer, I have to be absolutely sure Sure. that it has a legal basis. Well, sure enough, this was one of the top five election lawyers in the state. I'm not going to mention his name unless he calls in. He's welcome (laughs) to mention it. Uh, And and he um, uh, he said, you know, checked everything. And thank God he was courteous enough to give us a a nice fee, uh, you know, half price. It's a public thing. And uh, we found out that we had a law that could change. The law provides for four alternatives, and we picked the one that has an elected county executive but a board of supervisors, an unelected. Now, in Milt Hoffman's column, he, and by the way, he is great, Milt Hoffman. Who knows history in Westchester better than Milt Hoffman? He reminded us that that board, they tried to change it many years to comply with various things like the Voting Rights Act, and finally— It was just thrown out, and they came up with the Board of Legislators as a solution. And two of the districts in Yonkers were created to meet the minority requirements of the Voting Rights Act. Now, I think they threw the baby out with the bathwater. They shouldn't have moved so fast. There are ways to comply with the Voting Rights Act with weighted weighted voting and creating, for instance, in Yonkers. How would you deal if you took away the the two legislative districts? that were put there for the Voting Rights Act. Well, you've got five council seats. At least two of those council seats are minority districts. So already Yonkers has the ability to put five council members on this new board of supervisors. So we're, we're going to uh, you know, comply with Milt Hoffman's concern. We're not going back to a dinosaur. No, the old board of supervisors is not what we're looking at. This has got to be a new age newly constructed board that not only meets the Voting Rights Act, but also delivers the services that Westchester needs at a lower cost. That's the idea. I, I remember the, the bickering back and forth. Now, you, you, you know, not to rehash it, but the, this whole problem on the Board of Legislators started with a fellow named Eddie Vetrano. Oh, yes. Ed Vetrano was Greenberg. the supervisor of Greenberg, and he and the four councilmen brought an action against the County Board of Supervisors, because you had a real one-man, one-vote, uh, one-person, rather, one-vote. Well, they didn't have weighted voting in those right. days, so a small municipality right. could pa- have the Pound same— Ridge had the same right. vote as Ed Vitrano. We're not going back to that. You can no, be sure. No, 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 I understand that. But I'm saying that's how this whole thing started. Now, 
when the the the, the uh, old board of supervisors uh, uh, organizational chart was ruled unconstitutional so now they had to come up with something and i think milt and, and i don't want to uh, uh, without checking thoroughly but i think milt was a little off on saying that uh, the the uh, weighted voting rule was thrown out i don't think it was ever thrown out the weighted voting was one of the few things that was ruled constitutional that right. you could you can meet the requirements of the one person one vote right. law with weighted voting and if i'm correct i believe that nassau county adopted the weighted voting uh, rule uh, and i think who would they, know better than you tony I, well i think they did it up until about 10 12 years ago right. they 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 kept the old board that they had and just used weighted voting uh, but it's, it wasn't it's enough. A cumbersome. But, but but still, it wouldn't have been enough. You still need to comply with the minority voting requirements that's, uh, under of the, the Civil Rights uh, laws, of the Voting right. Rights Act, and that's yeah. what they did. That's what they had to do in in, in creating this new board of legislators in, in the past. Yeah. And we need to do that if we right. uh, uh, create but, a, a new board of supervisors. And I, I think that that that's the administrative uh, problem that you, you've got to uh, uh, address. Um, I think the, the, the real problem here is money, spending, yes. and how do we address that? Let's go back to what Frank said. For sure, a sure. Uh, we, he's probably still listening. You know, we do have a dysfunctional government at every level. You, you see what's happened in Albany, uh, the gridlock. And now, unfortunately, we've seen uh, with two trials, the, uh, the Bruno trial and the Seminario trial, the Republican-Democrat, that there is no accountability. I mean, you know, we can understand that people have to work for a living if there's a part-time job as a legislator. But you need to disclose. I remember the disclosure rules that I w was mm -hmm. under in Congress were intense. Everything has to be put there. But in Albany, practically nothing is, is, is on, on the table, so you don't know whether or not a, legislature, a legislator is doing services for himself or doing services for the public. And, you know, I wouldn't have said it, if Mr. Bruno wasn't convicted and Mr. Seminario didn't plead guilty. So obviously this tells you that there's a dysfunction there. But there's also a dysfunction, Tony, at every level of government because we've allowed incumbents to kind of design their own districts. As you know, congressional districts, the legislative districts for the Senate and state and in, 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 in the Senate and the Assembly in the state and even the county legislative districts have been artificially drawn so that people can protect themselves. Sure. And, and, you know, you might be able to do this a little bit. They're incumbent protection plans. Exactly. And, and they keep raising their salaries. Now, yeah. this is a, you know, the people are starting to feel that they're being made fools out of. And that's why you had this election where a 12-year incumbent was thrown out uh, as county executive and the and the board of the chairman of the board almost lost his election. Right. That tells you the voters are extremely upset and that government is dysfunctional. We have to go back to square one and structure government in such a way that it delivers services, maintains the quality of life in Westchester County that your parents and grandparents had and so that you could stay here. People are saying we can't afford to stay in Westchester anymore. This is not right. So there's a lot of things we have to look at. Hopefully this citizens initiative called Rethinking will have everybody thinking about what they see Westchester County has uh, in terms of their governmental structure. Well, I believe you're on the right uh, path here, Joe. I think the uh, uh, th there are two things. We, we need to have a, uh, a, a, a uh, body that will look at it and say, look, here's what really has to be done. And then we need to, an executive part of it where it's going to be executed. Um, we mentioned earlier one of the problems uh, in Westchester County, of course, is that we have too much government. Go back, all the way back to the Milk Hoffman in 1971, uh, uh, I think it was, when they had the new Board of Legislators. Um, every, uh, the, the old supervisors predicted to a fault that this was going to be one more massive layer of government, which it became. Right. The County Board of Legislators. Over 40 staffers. Right. I mean, <laughs> they all have staff. Yeah. They, they probably all have cars now. Four or five million dollars. And you don't need them. You know, and the proof of the pudding was that the old supervisors took care of everything for no money. Right. And that, they, that's the idea now that we could get elected officials that are mayors and town supervisors, and in the case of Yonkers, put on the, the town council, 
and let them know that they have another responsibility, and that's to look at the county side of it and decide what is it that the county should be doing versus what you should be doing. And Paul Finder said it very well. You know, if you can connect people like me directly to the county executive and avoid that layer of government, we'll be able to choose better what the town should do versus the county. Well, we're we're talking in generalities. Uh, I I think what what really needs to be done here is some people, probably smarter than I am, uh, sit down and review the whole operation of county government and see where we should go. Maybe it's not a a practical, functional uh, solution to dismantle government. Maybe the government should be, uh, you know, well, cut still, down a little bit. Well, maybe there are still people in Westchester who are saying that we don't need county government. Yeah. I'm not prepared. I'm one at of this them, by point. the way. <laughs> well, I'm not prepared at this point to go that far. But <laughs> uh, as you know, I've I've learned from Paul Finder, who's been doing a lot more in yeah. this area than me. Uh, Connecticut got rid of county government. Massachusetts doesn't have county government. Neither does Rhode Island. So at least three neighboring states of ours, we don't have county government, right. and they seem to be functioning now. New York State is a bit more complex, and maybe Westchester County is, but we'd have to see what structure would provide us the right services at the lowest cost. It's like, hey, what does business do? Business has to deliver in a competitive environment a product or a service that the people want to buy, and at the same time, make enough money to reward the employees and and the investors. And, And in government, I guess it's not exactly a bottom line, but it's called good governance. How do you provide services to keep the quality of life in Westchester, but being able to afford, allow people to afford to live here? That's absolutely true. But maybe as a starter, before we get to all the complicated ways of redoing the government, some of these functions, you know, uh, uh, for example, uh, the the county police, uh, which is a big burden, Uh, social services, Maybe we should start looking at transferring those to the state. The Human Rights Commission, yeah. which Can was we, already you, uh, a, so many a state function. Okay. Uh, this is Tony Calavita. My guest here today is former Congressman Joe Diaguardi. Uh, we have a few telephone callers waiting, so let's go to the telephones. Hello, you're on WBOX. Good morning. <laughs> what I can't understand is these salaries that are tremendous during these times that people can't find a job. I don't think it's fair. And a lot of people in government there, they have salaries galore. They have ways of getting more and more. And I don't, and, the, and yet they ask us to pay more and more in taxes. It isn't fair. Something should be done with that. But this is a good point. And, you know, p- much of what people are paid in the public sector gets disguised as pensions. Right. And if you look at what the Journal News has pointed out, uh, what people are doing is gaming the system. In effect, we have neighbors gaming neighbors here because if you're in the public sector and you want to maximize your pension, what you do is you have your friends allow you to create a lot of overtime in the last couple of years because that's the average that they pick in most cases to determine your pension. We need pension reform without a doubt and other things. Yes. Yeah, there's no question about that. And I I remember looking in Forbes magazine about, uh, about a year ago they took a uh, job in, I think it was uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. A police lieutenant retired. He uh, was making like 47000 a year. But by the time his pension was paid, um, it cost the city of Fort Lauderdale something like $20 million. You know, when they looked at the lifespan of this right. officer. And so that doesn't get put on the books as a liability in the public sector, right. so you don't know that it's coming. Well, uh, well just to follow up on that one thing, uh, Congressman, you have uh, that problem now in all local municipalities. So let's go to the telephone. Hello, you're on WBOX. Good morning. Yes, uh, Tony, Bob's voice. Hey, Robert, how are you? Hey, Bob. Good morning. Happy holidays. Merry same, Christmas same, to both of you. Same to you and your family. Keep fighting a good fight. Now tell me. Uh, what do we really do with New York State now that it's about to teeter over into a, what might be a default situation? What do we do with New York State? <laughs> what do what, we do with New York Bob, State? I mean, well, remember, what, what, what you're, 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 you're in America, the, and you have a right to vote for the other side. Bob, uh, what, what, what do you do? What do you do? As much as the other side. What, what do you do with Washington when Moody's is threatening maybe next year to downgrade Treasury bills uh, when you're afraid that China may not buy 
Uh, the, the bills, in fact, there's a big auction, and we're not sure if they're going to step forward with uh, Japan and, and Germany to pick them up. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in America. And if you remember the book I wrote, Unaccountable Congress, that's 17 years ago, Bob, Chapter 4, I entitled The Big Apple and Washington, one bailout after the other, because I saw the way we were following in the steps of New York City, borrowing money, not putting liabilities on the books, and then spending money we didn't have and borrowing it from people we didn't trust. In those days, it was Japan. Now it's China. Uh, that was 17 years ago. And now people are literally talking about the potential bankruptcy of the United States of America because we're going to add $10 trillion. This is what Obama says. $10 trillion in the next 10 years to the national debt that's on the books. That means $22 trillion. Even if you kept interest rates down to 5 6 and 7%, which I doubt you're going to be able to do the way we're spreading money around. We're going to have inflation. And don't forget, under Jimmy Carter, we had 21% prime rate. I remember, because I had a piece of property in Reading, Connecticut, and I remember paying on that mortgage 15% interest. Yeah. The point is that what will the interest be in 10 years if the national debt on the books, Tony, that means treasury bills, uh, is $22 trillion. And let's say it's just 5 6 or 7%. You're talking about five to seven hundred billion dollars just in interest. Now, wh where's that money going to come from? You you're going to push out other discretionary programs. There's going to be a riot here in America. We're well, not there's, planning there's already ahead. a riot going on with the Tea Parties, but but seems the Tea Party movement, which I've, I've got a number of them, they're they're all for cutting the services. There's a majority of America that's ready. You go into an austerity climate. It's the politicians that want to keep the big cell going. Well, the politicians are getting the message, as you well know, with the election we just here had in Westchester County, and there are going to be a lot of other surprises, I believe, in 2010. People are fed up at all levels of government, including with Mr. Obama. Now, you know, the audacity of hope has now become the audacity of big government and more borrowing and spending. Now, we can't afford that anymore. And, you know, everybody wanted him to succeed, as, as, as I did when he came in. But now we see that uh, instead of reducing government, we now have bigger government. And worse than that, the regulations that we were supposed to see to control Wall Street, the lobbyists have won. You know, and, and all of a sudden, those rules are being dumbed down. So when are we going to protect the uh, citizens and the taxpayers? We should have no increases in government at any level right now. People are losing their jobs. We should have a complete freeze, and we should go back to what I call for in my book for the federal government. We should do it all over, called zero-based budgeting. Don't add 2 5% to what you spent last year. You may have wasted it last year. Go back to dollar one and structure every budget from the ground floor up. That's the only way we're going to save money, and, and let's shoot for a budget that has no increases. Don't forget, we have a two-pronged thing at Rethinking. One is to immediately ask the Board of Supervisors for a Charter Revision Commission that has good citizen representation. And one of the ideas that I came up with is to have a, uh, uh, an audit committee uh, of, the, of, of Westchester County and then to have a chief financial officer here, Mr. Ryan comes out with his uh, proposal a few weeks ago saying he needs a controller. That's what we used to have in the 50s. Today, we need chief financial officers. So you can be sure we're going to ask for that. But why are we then having the people sign petitions, Bob? Because we don't trust the Board of, Super, uh, of, of Legislators based on their past performance. So they're going to know that in nine months, we're going to accumulate enough signatures under the law I mentioned, the alternative county, the form of county government law that requires us to have 10% of the voters in the last gubernatorial election, that's about 26,000 signatures. We're going to go for 50,000. But once we have that, then we know the law says we can replace the Board of Legislators. And that's our sort of Damocles. So it's like what Reagan said, trust but verify. We're going to try to trust them. We're going to see what they come yeah. up with. We're going to see whether they cooperate with the county executive. If they don't, we're going to get rid of them. Yeah. Well, you, you, obviously what you're asking them to do is to go along with a pr proposal that will eliminate them. So well, you know they're going to give you all kinds of lip service. Well, frankly, the county, the, the Charter Revision Commission would not necessarily ask them to get rid of themselves because we know that's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. But, but by having the voters file the petitions based on the law that we found in 1952, 
we know that we can eliminate them if they don't do the job. Yeah, well, it, it sounds think, good. Go ahead, Bob. I think it's a great idea, Joe. I know that rethinking, I've, I've been part of this group for a year now myself. They mean well. Their heart is in the right place. They're still catching criticism, though, amazingly, from some Republicans. But I think I think you have the right idea, and I wish you the best of luck Thank with you. it. Real conservatives in this county will be with you, and so will all the Tea Party activists. Great. And, and by the way, groundswell. we should ask for people who want to volunteer, Tony, Tony, to carry these petitions because we're going to finish the forms in the next week. Uh, but anybody who wants to carry the petition in their area, and sure. I guess this this is mainly the lower part of Westchester County that WVOX reaches, uh, should uh, feel free to call me on my mobile phone. I'll give it to them. It's 914-671-8583. That's 914 671 Eight five eight three, and if you forgot, you can't find a pencil that fast. Just look at the telephone book. I'm registered uh, in the directory there in Ossining, New York, where I live these days. What's the number again? Nine one four six seven one eight five eight three. We want representatives from all over the county. And we're going to have a little training session and then get them to start collecting the signatures because. It's like collecting signatures for an election. You need to record the data exactly right. Otherwise, it could be challenged. Yeah. But it, it's not a partisan thing. I don't want to keep you two gentlemen. I'm sure you have other callers who want to call in. But, Joe, I hear whispers that you might be considering either a run for Congress or a bigger run. <laughs> uh, good luck on whatever you do. Well, actually, you know, it's people that are asking me to seriously consider doing it. But, Bob, I'm 69 yet. And I don't even, you know, I, I love golf and traveling. That requires time. But you know what? I, you, you look never, pretty good. Thank you. I've never closed the door to public service in my mind. In fact, if you look at my FEC reports, you'll see that people for Dio Guardi still has money in it. So yeah, I can yeah. I could jumpstart it right away. But I want to be sure that there are people out there who really want someone like me, an independent-minded, certified public accountant, to uh, run again. Well, good luck, Joe. Thank, thank you very much, Bob. This is Bob Foyce. Um, I should mention Bob Foyce is the uh, chairman of the conservative party in the town of East Chester. And he's also on the executive committee of rethinking. Oh, is he? Yes. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Yeah. But uh, uh, let, let me say this, Joe, that no matter what happens, uh, you have uh, stoked this enough so that there'll be some good thinking. That's the point. You know, and, and so people will uh, focus on what, you know, why do we have this government and why do we have so much in taxes? Now we can spend another whole show on, how are you going to handle school districts, fire yeah, districts? And that has to be done. In uh, fact, the Cuomo law doesn't apply to counties. The law that was proposed last year to streamline government, it, it, it eliminates, it, it excludes counties. But it is pushing for people to look at government at all the levels below county right. and say how <coughs> we can consolidate fire districts, school districts, garbage districts, you name it. we got levels of government that are incredible here. And everybody, you know, to have a level of government, you need to have people to, to, to support those. So that's where you get these costs. Right. Well, I, I think it's very, very important that um, it, it, it has a good airing out, a exactly. good um, discussion. But when, so, when your neighbors are losing their jobs, we have to right. start thinking outside the box here and say, are we doing the right thing? Are we sharing the course of government in the right way? Now, Joe, you're hearing a little uh, music here, but uh, one, one quick question. What's going to happen with this health care bill that's uh, uh, you know, it is incredible how that was pushed through. You talk about uh, bribery. I mean, well, here, here, o Obama Nelson had to have was, something. Well, he had to have something. There's no doubt about it. But how they reconcile the House bill to the Senate bill is going to be incredible to see. I, I just don't know how they're going to do it. The, yeah. the issues that are going to come up are going to be immense. I know that Obama wants something, but I hope it's something yeah. that works. Well, 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 we'll have another show on that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tony Calavita. My guest today has been Joe Diaguardi, former congressman. Joe Diaguardi, thank, thank you, you so much for coming. I appreciate all that you've done, plus you. our friendship for many, many years.